No event at UCR should take place without our beginning by acknowledging the native people on whose land we are actually sitting right now, the Kawiya people. Um, and I want to begin by thanking them for their forbearance in allowing us to be here on their land and for their persistence, which teaches us a lesson about survival under the most devastating catastrophic conditions, which of course is entirely relevant to the topic of today's conference and tomorrow's conference, which is the fate of another people undergoing settler colonialism, an expression that I by no means wish to retract and which I do not consider to be anti-Semitic, merely descriptive. Um, I want to secondly, and first of all in a way in relation to the conference, Thank Lubna Kutami, who's just walked out of the room, um, who has been such a magnificent <laughs> organizer logistically and in every other way, and we'll thank her many other times, so um, let her know she's just been thanked. Thirdly, I want to thank the administration of this campus. I asked administrators to be here. It turns out that they all seem to be on a retreat. I don't know if they beat a hasty retreat in face of this conference. But let me just say that our administration here at UCR has been fairly good about defending rights of academic freedom, including on the issue of Palestine. However, they have been loath to do so publicly and forthrightly. And I think that there is a difference between quietly telling your faculty, we will not repress you, or telling your students, we will not prevent you from organizing on campus, and actually repudiating publicly the kind of attacks on their own students that take place on a daily basis, a daily basis so regular that many of the students who are attacked uh, by other students and non-students alike because they are Islamic, because they support Palestine, uh, or for any other reason associated with these issues, don't even bother to report it. So we are working in a context where the issue that has arisen is whether or not discrimination uh, is actually practiced when people criticize the state of Israel, when in fact the discrimination is happening on a daily basis against a very large number of our students and is not actually responded to adequately in a public and forthright fashion. So a thanks and a reprimand to our administration. However, this conference, even though it's not officially supported by UCR, has been supported by a really remarkable number of people, many of whom are represented in this room here. And I'm going to take a little time to thank every organization because I think it's important actually to acknowledge how many different organizations around Southern California and beyond have been willing to put their names behind this conference. It speaks to the way in which we feel that there is a crisis about freedom of expression happening right now, and for reasons that we will hear elaborated on over the next two days. First of all, the UCR Riverside Departments of Ethnic Studies and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies. Uh, we have had tremendous support all the time from organizations like Ethnic Studies for obvious reasons. People who do Ethnic Studies, people who do American Studies have given their lives to understanding situations of racism, discrimination, settler colonialism, and so forth. And therefore, it's hardly surprising that they recognize their kinship with the Palestinians struggling for self-determination and against apartheid and racism. And of course, Middle Eastern and Islamic studies, as we will hear on tomorrow's panel, has itself, of course, consistently been targeted on campuses nationwide uh, for speaking out about issues in the Middle East that are unpopular with certain sectors of the political world. Next, I want to thank Students for Justice in Palestine. You'll all get your opportunity to thank them personally tomorrow afternoon after our final keynote when they are very kindly hosting a reception for us. But I also want to thank SJP here because they have been a tower of strength over the last few years. They've succeeded in passing a divestment resolution twice. The first time it was turned back after considerable manipulation and threats by people including the Israeli consul. And so their persistence also and their organizing capacity and their spirit is something that I have been very, very pleased to observe. And I want to thank UA, UAW 2865, the union that represents UC graduate students, also sponsoring this panel, among the first unions in the country to actually um, come out for 
full BDS, not just for a divestment resolution, but for full D BDS. And I want to thank the representatives who are here today. I want to thank California Scholars for Academic Freedom uh, also, an organization that was founded in the early 2000s, am I correct? Nine years old we are, 2006, in response not specifically to the issue of Palestine, but to attacks on Middle Eastern studies, scholars, and organizations primarily, though of course California Scholars for Academic Freedom uh, is there to support scholars who are under attack for their expression in any area and, and so forth. And uh, I'm proud to say that many of our speakers here are members and even executive committee members of California Scholars for Academic Freedom, which has been dealing with such issues for almost 10 years now, issues that crop up over and over again that we don't always hear about, they don't become very public, but that are pretty much a constant monthly event in our experience. And this is, I think, the first conference that California Scholars for Academic Freedom has, has sponsored on this issue, but they are also sponsoring uh, a conference on November the 6th at UCLA, Near Eastern Studies uh, program is sponsoring that, and on the same day in Cal State Fresno. No. So I'm pleased to say that, that uh, this conference is part of a whole series of conferences addressing academic freedom um, that are pushing back against the attempts to restrict it. I also want to thank a number of other organizations who stepped up, and I want to say that many of these organizations stepped up without even being invited to. They saw the announcement of the, the early announcement of the conference and then stepped up and asked if they could sponsor it. These are American Muslims for Palestine, Palestine Legal, Palestine American Women's Association. The the oh, excellent. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, let me continue. The Palestinian Youth Movement, um, LA, Orange County, and Inland uh, Empire chapters. Jewish Voice for Peace, of whom we have a representative sitting right there. The International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network, who have recently produced, as have Jewish Voice for Peace, reports on the funding of the backlash against academic freedom on our campuses. Um, I believe JVP has materials on that, and you can talk to Tali. Tali, stand up. Um, Tali has materials, and also you can ask her more about JVP and its work. And IJAN's executive summary of the report, I put a few copies outside. If they run out, we can make more. So please feel free to take the information and disseminate it. Uh, LA Jews for Peace are here, and will be speaking on a panel this afternoon. And I believe so are Friends of Sabil from Los Angeles and Friends of Sabil from Orange County. And finally, uh, Jews for Palestinian Right of Return and then the organization to which uh, I'm proud to say I belong, the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, which I'll say a few words about in a minute. One more organization that I want to mention, uh, it was too late for this organization to actually sponsor the conference since we've only just set it up. Uh, we're forming here at UCR a, an organization which will be called Faculty for Justice in Palestine, one of whose purposes is actually to provide defense and support for SJP as they come under attack. And I'm happy to say um, that since I sent out a call for people to join it, already 25 people have, have signed up since yesterday. So um, this is a wonderful campus to be at. I'm incredibly happy to be here because we have a fighting faculty at Riverside and it's, it's great to, to be here. Um, many of those faculty also stood up last spring when the event that made me feel I really had to uh, initiate this conference took place, which was that a nasty little group, um, I believe it's about two people, but they give themselves a very large umbrella called the AMCA Initiative, found out somehow that one of our students was running an independent course. These are fairly familiar to anybody who works on campus. Um, a course to study Palestine run by students and attended, obviously, by students. And they sent a letter to the chancellor. They didn't bother to consult either me, who was the professor mentoring the student, or the student herself to, to actually ask what we were studying and what, what the syllabus was like. They simply sent a note to the chancellor asking uh, for the course to be, in a very significant term, eliminated. And I thought that term really stuck out to me. The idea that speech about Palestine should be eliminated. And as I've said before, the idea that one could now say that a group of African-American students getting together to study their history 
should be disallowed on campus is almost, not entirely, but almost unthinkable. The idea that Chicano students might study their own history is almost unthinkable. But that a group of Palestinian, and indeed not only Palestinian, it was a very, very diverse group of students, uh, that a group of Palestinian students should organize a course devoted to the study of their history uh, was seen as something that should be eliminated, tells you a lot about the anxiety that the simple study of the facts about Israel uh, provokes particularly when we had lent over backwards in preparing this syllabus to include a wide range of Israeli and Jewish opinion from Zionist historians like Benny Morris to Zionist writers like David Grossman to anti-Zionists anti uh, as well. So there was a full spectrum of Jewish opinion, but the idea that we could actually talk about models, for example, of Israel as a settler colonial state was infuriating so infuriating that they wouldn't even bother to check the syllabus and realize that the article that the students were reading about settler colonialism was written by an Israeli and mostly concentrated on Israeli sociological paradigms of settler colonialism as a descriptor for the Israeli state. So the kind of ignorance and stupidity that the backlash is provoking is one of the most alarming things. It's not only the attempt to shut down academic discourse, in my view, it's also the attempt to introduce stupidity into people's thinking, at which they seem to be remarkably successful. I want to say, just uh, in, in closing, that um, I think this issue is important not only for the sake of those of us who are engaged with the issue of justice for Palestine, but that this is the thin edge of the wedge for closing down academic freedoms of all kinds. One of the groups that signed on to AMCA Initiative's attempt to eliminate this course was David Horowitz's Freedom Center, an organization that has been trying to shut down so-called tenured radicals. I wish I could find a lot of these people because there aren't that many tenured radicals that I, I meet in my daily life at, at campuses, but I assume they're out there in the shadows or maybe under the bed with the reds. But David Horowitz is the kind of person who's been trying to shut down academic expression, uh, you know, a range of political causes for a very long time. And to allow this kind of discourse about what is permitted and what is not to infiltrate our campuses is a way in which groups like that will succeed in shutting down a hell of a lot more. Um, and they've attempted that in past and failed and they won't give up attempting again. It seems to me that closing down speech about Palestine and about Israel is actually a matter of fleeing from debate. Since uh, groups like U.S. ACB, the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, were formed in 2009 after Israel's assault on Gaza, we have seen the supporters of Israel more and more flee away from actually debating the issues because over and over again they see that once the facts come out, they lose. So what we are really about, I think, in all these movements that are, that are really trying to push for um, some clarity about uh, what's happened in Palestine and pushing also for remedies like BDS is not so much that we think we will achieve sanctions on Israel tomorrow, but rather the very practice of talking about and trying to persuade people to move in the direction of boycott, divestment and sanctions produces debate and produces a public awareness of the issues that was absolutely impossible to imagine uh, six, and even six years and even longer ago. So in the face of the current media travesty that is in their reporting on what's happening in Palestine right now, their refusal to analyze the larger context of occupation and discrimination that has produced the violence, let alone discussing the context of rampant settler violence that has been taking place, or the multiple military assaults that Israel has inflicted on Gaza over the past five years, all that blackout of information, as long, along with the political blockade on movement with regard to Israel and Palestine, the lockstep support that our Congress and Senate give to Israel, along with the administration, means that our task is to build a civil society movement. A civil society movement depends not on secrecy, subversion, outside agitators. It depends on moving into the public sphere and being open in everything we do and say. So I hope that the next couple of days will give us an example of an open forum for debate I am assuming that everybody who's here is here for that purpose and will, of course, respect openness and debate.
And uh, in the interest of that, because we are expecting quite a lot of people over the next couple of days, I have asked the moderators to restrict every question or comment to about two minutes so that everybody has a chance to actually make their intervention and be heard, and panelists and keynote speakers have a chance to respond. So I hope everybody will, will respect those protocols, and I look forward to hearing our first keynote, and ask my colleague Christine Gailey to introduce her. Thank you.